Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all joining us this evening. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I have a 15-year-old son with Duchenne, and I have the pleasure of working with an amazing team of individuals like Rick here at Defeat Duchenne Canada. Emergency care is something I hope we all avoid. And as a as a parent, it's something that we all worry about. But the reality is we will never know when we might find ourselves in this type of situation. And some of us really have, and some of us already have experience with this, unfortunately. But the best thing we can do is to be prepared and have a plan. And that is exactly what Defeat Duchenne Canada is hoping to do for you today. And I'm thrilled to have two leading Canadian experts and a Duchenne family here with us today to educate us about adrenal insufficiency and emergency care. By the end of this webinar, you'll have all the necessary information to help you manage your steroid treatment and help you manage an emergency situation should you find yourself in one. To help us with this today, we have Dr. Laura McAdam, who leads the neuromuscular team at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehab Hospital here in Toronto. We have Dr. Leanne Ward, a pediatric endocrinologist and medical director at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Bone Health Clinic in Ottawa. Both of these incredible ladies are not only exceptional physicians, they have and continue to volunteer and dedicate many hours of their time supporting and advocating on behalf of our community. So thank you both for agreeing to share your knowledge and your expertise with us today. We also have the Provenzano family with us. Tori is a 20 year old in his third year at the University of Windsor and he majors in computer science. And joining Tori is his father, Frank, and Frank is um, Frank and his family have been associated with Jesse's journey for um, now Defeat Duchenne Canada for over 15 years. Frank has also volunteered many of his hours as a member of our research funding advisory group. And up until last year, he also chaired our Duchenne Family Advisory Committee. So Frank and Tori are both passionate and about supporting families with Duchenne. And we're so very fortunate to have them both here with us today sharing their experience. So thank you both. The agenda for this evening will start with Tori and Frank's story, followed by a presentation from Dr. Ward and also an interactive session with Dr. McAdams. So audience um, participation will be required during that time. Uh, we've also left, left lots of time at the end for questions. So if you have questions that come to mind during the talks, please feel free to type them in the chat box at any time. We will make sure to address all of the questions at the very end after we hear from all of our speakers. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Frank and Tori. Can, can you hear my, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud. Okay. I just wanted to make sure before I started talking. So hi, my name is Tori Provenzano, I'm 20 years old. I have Duchenne muscle dystrophy and I just wanted to quickly discuss my experience last summer with um, fat embolism syndrome after a fall. So first I'm gonna just describe what happened. Um, I was going into my room, I was sitting at the edge of my chair and I, that's, it was very stupid of me to do that. And I hit the edge of my desk and I fell off my chair, landing on my left knee and my left shoulder because I, turn myself to the side so I didn't hit my face. Um, and the, the weird thing about the fall is that I felt fine. It felt like a regular fall. I felt like I bruised my leg or something. So I was like, I'm fine. It's no big deal. And then I got into bed for a bit just to relax. And I started getting really hazy, really confused. Because everything started to get like fuzzy. And I remember specifically starting to watch a movie, remembering the beginning of it and not remembering the ending because I felt I was completely out of it. And then I woke up in the hospital like a week later and it, everything was fuzzy. I had no idea what happened. I could remember the fall vaguely, but other than that, it wasn't really much. I was also full of medication. So everything was, I was having hallucinations. It was very bizarre. Now, the weird thing is I had no cast on my leg. The I had a I did have a break on my leg, but it was a hairline fracture, so it was very small, and it was very difficult to see on an X-ray. And the only way for it to be able to see was with a CT scan, which I thought that was that just proves that like how little 
damage can be caused to cause fat embolism syndrome. And I also had gaps in my memory. Like I couldn't remember passwords. I couldn't remember shows I was watching. It, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it complete amnesia, but it was get little gaps in my memory. It was very patchy. And finally, it was also when I was in the hospital in the ICU near the end of the um, visit, I was having difficulty breathing a little bit. I was on oxygen and it just was, it was very difficult. But I just wanted to share my experience. And because I was pretty much unconscious the entire time, I don't really have the knowledge of what actually went down. So this is just one to express what I felt, how, what I experienced, what the whole thing felt like. Well, thank you, Tori. I guess um, I'll fill in the gaps that Tori doesn't remember. Um, like Tori said, uh, he did fall. And we wanted to take him in to get x-rays, but uh, as Tori mentioned, he said he was okay. It wasn't a bad fall. And uh, we got him into bed. And uh, like, like, like Tori said, we put on a, uh, one of his favorite movies that uh, you know, he would laugh at. And for about the first 45 minutes, he seemed okay. I mean, obviously a little agitated, but we attributed that to the fall. Um, about 45 minutes into it, like Tori said, he, he became quiet, not laughing. He seemed very confused and out of it. Um, we were concerned, um, so we checked his head and his shoulders and his neck. Uh, he did tell us that he didn't uh, fall on his head or bang his head or hit his face. It was shoulder and leg only. Um, we wanted to take him to uh, emergency for x-rays. He said he was fine, um, and he was just tired, and he wanted to sleep. Um, so we checked on him a little bit at the beginning of the night. He seemed, uh, again, agitated, but again, restless, uh, but totally understandable. Uh, the next morning, uh, when we woke up, Tori was um, having extreme difficulties. He was having trouble breathing. His heart rate was racing, and uh, he wasn't really responsive to um, any of the questions we, ha we had for him. He couldn't keep his eyes open. Uh, and at, at that point, uh, we called the ambulance and took him into emergency. Um, we obviously told them that, you know, Tori had a fall. Uh, he has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and uh, we did bring his meds or a list of his meds plus the flat squirt with us. Um, they took an x-ray. They found a fracture in his shoulder, but as Tori said at the time, uh, they couldn't find any fracture. Um, during the day in emergency, uh, they were really struggling to get him uh, stabilized. His heart rate was, you know, 160. He was having trouble with oxygen. And at that point, um, it was decided, luckily, that there was an opening in the ICU and uh, Tori was admitted into the ICU. Um, in the ICU, um, they were still having uh, difficulty stabilizing Tori. They couldn't get his heart rate under control, uh, his breathing, uh, he had breathing difficulties. Um, and after you know about a day, um, the doctors were very concerned and they suggested that we need to put Tori on a ventilator so we can uh, stabilize them. And uh, that's, that's what happened. Um, the, the big thing, I guess we want to say is that, you know, we thought as parents, we had some control and we were proactive and we were ready. Um, but to, to be fair, we did not really any, even understand what fat embolism syndrome was, um, what to look for, like the signs. Um, for example, as as Tori got kind of confused after 45 minutes, that was a sign. Um, and also the severity, uh, it could be fatal. Um, we also brought um, Deflazacort with us. Um, we wanted to make sure that we brought it from home uh, because really they didn't know what it was and they didn't have any there. So hopefully that'll be something that you might want to remember. Um, and of course, we really didn't understand um, that under stress and trauma, the proper uh, protocol is to uh, increase the, sto the dosage. Um, and, and the last thing we did that was important that I wanna share is that um, we contacted Tory's caregivers in uh, London who um, basically went through all these things with the doctors in the ICU. Um, because I think it's fair to say that most hospitals don't deal with rare diseases and don't know all the intricacies 
and all the things that they should know. Um, the ordeal was terrible. Um, luckily, we, we came out um, being okay. Tori's fully recovered. And I think that the bottom line is no matter how well you think you're prepared, um, when something happens like this, the confusion, the stress, the panic, you might not remember all the things you need to. So I think it's important to put together some kind of package, have all the numbers and contacts of all your uh, doctors that you have that deal with the Shane, and, and please share that immediately with the uh, emergency staff if you have to happen to go to emergency. I think, um, I think that's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank and Tori, for sharing your story. Um, I mean, that must have been just a, a horrible situation for you. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that Tori is, is feeling good and he's back on track. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing this and, and helping our families so that we can hopefully um, be prepared for these kinds of situations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ward, uh, who's going to talk Yay. to us about adrenal insufficiency Hi. and steroid management. Dr. Ward? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to be here this evening talking about this important subject. And I really appreciated hearing Tori and Frank's story as well. So thank you very much. I'm going to just share my screen, pull up my slides. All right. Can everybody see my slides? I'll take that as a yes. yes. So I've been asked, yes. Great. I've been asked to talk about adrenal insufficiency in Duchenne. The goal this evening is to raise awareness just as Frank and Tori have done and to give you some tips for at-home management. I know there's some health professionals on the call as well and try to give some tips there and certainly look forward to everybody's questions. So what is adrenal insufficiency? It's also known as adrenal suppression or steroid dependence. You'll hear all three terms used interchangeably. I like the term steroid dependence because it automatically communicates that the patient is dependent upon their steroids for their well-being. But certainly you'll hear adrenal insufficiency and adrenal suppression. The story starts with the adrenal glands, which are these cute little glands that sit on top of the kidneys, adrenal on top of the kidneys. The adrenal glands make a really important hormone called cortisol, which is necessary for our well being and it's important in situations of medical stress. When someone is taking steroids as part of therapy for their condition, like in Duchenne with the flazacort and prednisone and potentially vomorolone, the body is very smart and says, well, I don't need to work hard very here. I'm going to just go to sleep. The adrenal glands just sort of nod off and they stop working to produce that important hormone called cortisol. So the adrenal glands are there. They're just in hibernation, so to speak. The adrenal gland is like a factory. It produces this hormone, as I mentioned, called cortisol, this well-being hormone, this hormone that responds to medical stress. And it really is a, like a factory because there's many, many steps that go into producing that critical hormone called cortisol. When I think about the natural role of cortisol in our body, when the adrenals make this hormone, I liken it to the gas in our tank. So cortisol is very much like the gas in our tank, it gives us our get up and go. It helps us to fight infection and it helps us to withstand medical stresses. So without it, we don't feel very well. And indeed it is a life sustaining hormone that we can't live without. How is the adrenal gland signaled or told to turn on its production of cortisol? So it's signaled by a message from the brain called corticotrophin releasing factor that comes from the hypothalamus in the brain. And then corticotrophin releasing factor stimulates the pituitary, which is just below the hypothalamus, to produce another hormone called adrenocorticotrophin hormone. And ACTH then stimulates the adrenal gland to produce cortisol, and that's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis. 
Now, when someone is taking the flazacort or prednisone, whether daily or intermittent or potentially lamorolone, a newer dissociative steroid, the steroids that are being taken as part of the therapeutic approach then turn off this access. This access, as I said, is very sensitive. And when there's steroid around in the form of medicine, the access says, well, we don't need to work hard here. We already have some steroid on board. And those signals all get blunted and the adrenal gland is not told to produce cortisol. And so this is called exogenous steroid therapy causing suppression of the HPA axis. That's kind of the medical lingo to describe that situation. Cortisol, as I mentioned, is so important for the body's ability to handle medical stress. What are the situations that require cortisol and in fact, extra cortisol to help combat these situations? One is fever. And we define fever as more than 38 degrees, 38 degrees or more. Now there's nothing magical about that number. If you have a fever of 37.9 and you don't feel well, that would also encourage you to think about stress steroid coverage. Vomiting illnesses are another situation where we need extra steroid to combat that situation. Accidents like fractures also trigger the need for higher cortisol levels in our body. And then surgery, anytime going under anesthesia, this is a time when our cortisol levels go up in the body naturally, or we have to give extra steroid to manage those situations. So when a patient is on steroids and has a medical stress, we have to give more steroid, essentially to mimic the body's natural response to the stress. And we give it in the form of oral hydrocortisone, Sometimes people also use their own steroid like flazacort or prednisone to give those extra doses like Frank said, and intramuscular hydrocortisone is sometimes needed as well. And we'll talk about that now in more detail. So when patients lack stress steroid dosing but need it because their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is shut down, then they will have the following symptoms, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, headache, body aches and pains, low blood pressure, and I have another slide with the, another even longer list. But what I want to stop and point out here is that none of these signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency or adrenal suppression are particularly red flags in the sense that they're just vague symptoms. You could attribute them to anything. You could attribute them to a long day at school or a gastrointestinal illness or a headache because of concentrating hard at school or body aches and pains because of having done more in a given day. So this is one of the reasons why adrenal suppression sometimes goes missed. It's because all of the signs and symptoms are very nonspecific, very vague, and they get attributed to other causes. Certainly, we do encourage all patients who are taking steroids, whether in the Duchenne setting or in any other setting, to have a medical alert bracelet that signals that they're steroid dependent. And that's one way of helping healthcare providers in the emergency room or on the wards in the hospital to know that a patient requires extra steroids because of adrenal suppression. Now, this is the long list of other potential signs and symptoms of an adrenal insufficiency or an adrenal crisis. And I pulled this from the wonderful PJ Nikoloff steroid protocol. And I understand that Mr. Nikoloff is on the call this evening, which is great. This document has been a real gift to the Duchenne community. It describes adrenal suppression in detail, and you can find it on the PPMD website and, and probably on Defeat Duchenne Canada as well. These are the symptoms and signs of adrenal crisis. Again, very nonspecific. Abdominal pain, shock, confusion or coma, dehydration, dizziness, fatigue, flank pain, pain in the side, headache, fever, loss of appetite, loss of consciousness, low blood pressure, nausea, weakness, rapid heart rate, rapid respiratory rate, slow sluggish movement, sweating on the face of the palms and vomiting. So we have a low threshold for thinking about someone having adrenal suppression potentially because these symptoms and signs are quite nonspecific. When and how to give steroid stress dosing. So 
we certainly don't expect you to come up with this on your own. We would expect that you would partner with your healthcare provider to develop a plan for managing adrenal insufficiency in the short term in your home. And these are the sorts of general principles that you would be thinking about. Now, there's lots of different ways to manage adrenal suppression. Every clinic does it slightly differently. So I'm going to speak mostly just in principles this evening so that you take away sort of the top line messages. If you are on steroids and your HPA axis is suppressed, which we always assume it is, no matter what the steroid dose is that you're on for the treatment of your condition, and you have a non-vomiting illness, either fever, and I discussed that 38 uh, degrees Celsius or more defines fever, but if you felt really unwell and your temperature was um, 37.9 or 37.8, that would not discourage you from treating for adrenal suppression. Or if you have a cold with flu-like symptoms bad enough to stay home from school, not just the sniffles, usually has to be a little bit more in terms of not feeling well surgery, including dental surgery, anything that puts you under anesthesia, or a fracture of the arm or the leg, these would be situations where you need extra steroid. Because you're not vomiting or your loved one is not vomiting, you can give the steroid orally. We would suggest that you take the usual dose of deflazacort, prednisone, or vomorolone in the morning. Some clinics for the evening dose or the late afternoon dose will use the very same steroid the flazacort, prednisone, or vermorolone, and suggest taking that for stress steroid dosing, a second dose in the day or 50% of that dose, depending on the dose that you're already on. Other clinics use a different type of steroid called hydrocortisone in order to top up the dose. Hydrocortisone um, mimics the natural steroid in our body, and so some clinics use that. Both approaches are very reasonable. The most important thing is to have an approach. So you'll take extra steroid in collaboration with your healthcare provider who will map that out ahead of time for you. And then if your child or your loved one has a vomiting illness and is unable to take their daily prednisone, deflazacort, or vermorolone and keep it down for at least 45 minutes, or if they have more than one episode of vomiting in a 24-hour period, even if they kept the first dose down, so more than one episode of vomiting, then you would give intramuscular hydrocortisone. And we teach families in our clinic how to do this. This is something very important to take if you're traveling as well, and you don't necessarily know where the hospitals are gonna be in your region. Intramuscular hydrocortisone is like a vaccine. It goes in the muscle and families can learn how to do this. Now, it does require re-education. So if you haven't had to do intramuscular hydrocortisone and a year goes by or two years, you may forget how to do it. So we try to educate the families on an annual basis so that they stay comfortable giving the intramuscular hydrocortisone in case of vomiting. We talked about these situations where you need extra steroid called stress steroid dosing, fever, vomiting, accidents, surgery. Tori talked about fat embolism syndrome, and I want to specifically highlight this for you because fat embolism syndrome is life-threatening. So let's talk about fat embolism syndrome. This is an indication for stress steroid dosing as well, as Frank and Tori said. So with fat embolism syndrome, this is what happens. When a patient has subnormal mobility, anyone, and when a patient is on steroids, anyone who's taking steroids, there is an accumulation of fat called adipocytes in the bone marrow within the long bones, within the femurs and the tibia. At the time of a bone fracture or even just a bone bruise, Tori mentioned that he didn't have a very significant fracture. So even just a bruise on the bone or a little crack that's not visible in the x-ray, that little crack can dislodge those adipocytes and they coalesce, they come together in the bloodstream to form fat globules, which shower the lungs and they can get into the brain as well and cause neurological deterioration, just like Tori described, as well as difficulty breathing, respiratory distress. And Dr. McAdam on the call here this evening has described this phenomenon. And unfortunately, fat embolism syndrome can cause respiratory distress requiring hospitalization, ICU admissions, and death. So this is something we really want families to know about. 
the respiratory distress and neurological deterioration can start uh, uh, soon after the fall or a few hours later, or even the next day. So it's not necessarily immediate and stress steroid dosing is required. So we consider respiratory distress and neurological deterioration after a fall to be a medical emergency. So all patients require stress dosing guidelines. They should be educated on these approaches to giving extra steroid in the face of medical stress. We encourage everybody to wear a medical alert bracelet that says adrenal insufficiency or steroid dependence. And we suggest that the steroid stress dosing education start around the time of steroid initiation and that it's not done some years later. Very important that you have a care plan in place outside of an emergency situation so that you're fully equipped and you have a number to call for guidance. So we do not expect you to be managing adrenal suppression at home for days on end. We expect that you have a few tools and a little bit of knowledge in the short term to get you organized, to get a dose of intramuscular hydrocortisone in, and then that buys you time to call your healthcare provider and discuss the next step or go to the emergency room and talk to the physicians there and be cared for then. So having the home plan for the oral hydrocortisone or the extra steroid per your usual dose or um, intramuscular hydrocortisone is part of an overall plan that gives you something to do in the first few hours, first day or so of the illness that requires the, the care, but we wouldn't expect you to continue to manage this long-term at home. So what are the next steps if you're giving steroid stress dosing at home? If you gave intramuscular hydrocortisone because of a vomiting illness, you would contact your prearranged contact person or you would go to the nearest emergency department. Now, who will this contact person be? Your neuromuscular specialist will guide you in that. It will either be the neuromuscular clinic or it will be an endocrinologist such as myself or the endocrinology on-call team. Perhaps it's your general pediatrician, but there will be somebody identified who you can call when you need to. If you gave oral hydrocortisone, it means that your loved one or you yourself or the patient is not as sick and you can continue to do that for a couple of days at home. If it's going on for more than two days or so that the patient is unwell, then you would contact your healthcare provider for more guidance at that point. We encourage everybody to have what's called a wallet card or something on their phone that says they have Duchenne, that says they're on regular steroid and that has the emergency dose. The emergency rescue dose, if you will, is 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone per meter squared. An infant will have a meter squared of about 0.25, a peripubertal child will have a meter squared of about one, and then an adult about two. So if you're 10 years of age, and you need an emergency dose of hydrocortisone, it's 100 milligrams times one, which is 100 milligrams. And so this is a nice guide to give someone at the emergency room or to show the paramedics if you're ever in that sort of situation. Now, we go to great lengths to teach intramuscular hydrocortisone, but most families don't ever need to use it, and that's a good thing. However, if you do need to use it, you're certainly glad that you have it. Very important when you're traveling as well. So I think of it like an insurance policy. It's one of those things where you hope you never need it. You probably won't need it, but you're glad that you have one if you do. Very important to never stop steroids abruptly. Remember the adrenal glands are asleep, they're hibernating, and they have to wake up very gradually by doing a careful steroid wean, going down on the dose very gradually if you've made the decision with your healthcare provider to come off the steroids. They cannot, under any circumstances, be stopped abruptly because the adrenal glands need time to wake up. So on the left, you would never just be on your regular dose of steroid and then stop. On the right, you would come up with a weaning schedule with your healthcare provider. Some rules of thumb are that you divide, you decrease the dose rather by about 25% every couple of weeks, just as a guide. The longer you've been on steroids, the slower you need to wean. If when you're weaning, as per your healthcare provider schedule, you start to feel unwell, headache, 
nausea, aches and pains, abdominal pain, extreme fatigue, then you go back up to the dose at which you felt well and you hold there for another couple of weeks before starting to wean again and you wean a little bit more slowly the second time around. This calendar sort of gives you an idea of how we wean. If you're on three pills, the following week when you start your wean, you'll do two on one day and three on the next and kind of alternate. And then the next week, two pills a day and then start to alternate two with one, that kind of thing. But you would do that again with your healthcare provider. If you have made the decision to wean steroids for whatever reason, you will wean to what's called a physiological dose of steroids, a dose that is natural for the body. And once that is done, the patient will hold that dose. And the next step is to formally test the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So we test the HPA axis because we want to make sure the adrenal glands have completely recovered. The way the testing works is that the patient stays on physiological doses of steroids and continues to stress dose until the test results are back. So you have to still do this while you're undergoing testing. A cortisol level specifically at 8 a.m. doesn't have to be fasting is done to determine if the patient needs daily steroids. Stress dosing is still required though, even if you pass the 8 a.m. cortisol test. If the 8 a.m. cortisol is normal, then the patient can stop the daily steroids, but stress dosing is still needed for medical stress. Once the 8 a.m. cortisol is normal, the patient stops daily steroids, continues to stress dose, and then the healthcare provider would typically book an ACTH stim test. We give ACTH to see if we can stimulate the adrenals to do what they need to do to pop up the cortisol level. Sometimes multiple tests are needed to prove that the patient can respond appropriately to ACTH and make enough cortisol. Sometimes it can take a year or two, sometimes even longer before the adrenal glands ultimately wake up. And that's very specific to a given patient and quite variable. So I encourage you just to work with your healthcare provider in that regard. My final messaging is around what to do if you're not sure if you should steroid stress dose. And the message here, and this is probably the most important message I could give you this evening. If you're in a situation where you think maybe you need to stress steroid dose, don't agonize over it. You do it. You always err on the side of caution. You can never run into trouble by doing steroid stress dosing for a single dose. You can never run into trouble. But not doing steroid stress dosing can be life-threatening. So we always err on the side of caution and we don't want you to agonize over the decision, should I do it or not? If you've thought about it, you should do it and then call your healthcare provider for more guidance. So on the other hand, not doing it can have severe consequences, as I said. So steroid stress dosing saves lives. And that's the message we wanna leave you with tonight that this is a life saving intervention. And this is why we're taking the time to run a webinar and make sure that this message is getting out post to post to post. And with that, I just want to once again acknowledge the PJ Nikoloff steroid protocol. This has a lot of information for healthcare providers and also is a good read for family members to discuss with their healthcare providers. And we're really grateful for the Nikoloff family for having uh, put this together in collaboration with uh, PPMD. I really appreciate your attention and I look forward to your questions and just really I'm thankful that this is a topic that's on everyone's radar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. And I see we have a few questions coming through the chat box, but we are going to hold off on those until the very end. I'd like to pass it over to Dr. McAdam to take us through some example cases. Um, and I will share my screen in a second here. Okay, can, it, can you see that okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So I, first off, I would like to thank Tori for sharing his story. It really highlighted um, information that everybody needs to know about fat embolism syndrome, as well as the importance of knowing about adrenal suppression and steroid dosing in the context of illness. And I also appreciate Frank's perspective um, because he was advocating for his son in the hospital and um, 
And in pediatrics, as well as in adult health care, it's so important to have individuals in your circle of care that know about your condition, as well as know about steroids and Duchenne. Uh, and I also would like to thank Leanne Ward for her presentation. It really highlighted the importance of adrenal suppression, as well as the actions that can be done, both from a healthcare provider perspective, as well as a family and an individual with Duchenne. So what I'd like to do is lead us through a series of cases, just really highlighting some of the information that Dr. Ward discussed and, uh, and seeing what you as an audience think are um, would be the right course of action for these cases. If you could advance the slide, please. Okay, so case one. So Samir is an eight-year-old male with Duchenne, and he's treated with the Flascourt of 27 milligrams daily. So that's 0.9 milligrams per kilogram per day. So this morning, he woke up with a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius and body aches. So this is the question we're going to everyone in the audience for. So um, what body temperature is considered a fever? So is it A, 36 degrees Celsius, B, 37.5, or C, 38? So right now we're about 57% participating. And so we're seeing the majority of individuals are saying, uh, 38 degrees. So answer C. So 74% have said that. And you're right. So when um, Dr. Ward's on Dr. Ward's slide, she talked about her temperature being 38 degrees. Um, some people, so six of 27 people indicated 37.5. And I can appreciate why people would also choose that answer because really at the end of the day, it is um, reflecting on how your body is feeling. And so if you're feeling unwell with a slightly higher temperature, then that's when we need to think about what the next steps are. Okay, so now the next question is, what should you do with a steroid medication? So A, do not give his morning dose of deflazacort, B, give his morning dose of deflazacort, or C, give an intramuscular dose of hydrocortisone. So right now we have the majority of people choosing B. So give his morning dose of deflazacort. So we're about 92%. And a few people are wondering about giving an intramuscular dose of hydrocortisone. And I think it's really going to come down to how is Samir doing? So um, right now we know he's got a fever and he's got some body aches. So I would definitely give his morning dose of deflazacort and see how he's doing with it and see, is he able to keep that medication down? Okay. So now we'll move on to the next question. All right. So would you give another dose of steroid medication later in the day? So we have two choices here. So one would be yes, and then the other one would be no. Excellent, I'm so glad we asked this question. So, um, so when I'm looking at the polling right now, so 74% of you have said, yes, you would give another uh, dose of steroid medication later in the day. And 26% said, no, you wouldn't. So in the, for Samir right now, because he has a temperature and he's feeling unwell, um, I would follow your protocol that your local team has given you regarding stress dosing. Um, so you would, in my clinic, what we would do is we would give the morning dose of deflazacort. And then midway through the day, because he has, Samir has a fever, we would recommend that he has an extra half dose of deflazacort. Whereas in other clinics, they may actually recommend a dose of hydrocortisone. But at the end of the day, if you're unwell with a fever, or if you aren't feeling well, give that extra dose of corticosteroid. So this, I'm just going to highlight the slide from 
uh, Dr. Ward. So when and how to give stress steroids. So he, so Samir had a non-vomiting illness. He had a fever and, uh, and he was just not feeling well. So we give the usual dose of the Plasicort or prednisone or Vomorolone in the morning, and then another dose later in the day, because remember those adrenal glands are a little uh, sleepy and they aren't able to generate that extra steroid that the body needs when you're feeling unwell. Okay, now this is just a side question and we haven't talked about it today, but I wanted to know what your thoughts are. Um, can you give a medication to help with the fever? So if your son isn't feeling well, would you give him something to help overall with the fever? So definitely the steroid medication, but would you give him something else? Excellent, so so far we have, 100% of people saying yes, and you are absolutely right. So if you're having, if, you're, if your son has a fever and he's feeling unwell, you can absolutely give him something to help treat the fever. And so a lot of people will use Tylenol. Um, and with Advil, you just need to be thoughtful about Advil um, or ibuprofen, um, because if you're on an ACE inhibitor or if there's any concern from a heart function standpoint, your cardiologist may not recommend ibuprofen. So that'd be an important discussion to have with your care team, but absolutely you can give acetaminophen or Tylenol because that works through the kidneys or sorry, through the, through the liver. Um, and so there's no concern if you're also on an ACE inhibitor like Clindipro. Okay. So next slide. Um, so when do you let your doctor know if he's unwell? Um, would, he, would you let them know immediately? Would you let them know B if he's unwell? after two to three days, or if you're concerned, or if he's unwell after five days. Okay, so what I'm seeing is the majority of people, so 72% said if unwell after three days, um, 24% said immediately and 4% said if unwell after five days. So the majority of people chose answer B. And I think it really depends on your comfort level as a, as a family or as an individual with Duchenne. So if you're concerned or if you want to ask questions uh, with your care team, absolutely you should reach out to them. And that's really about having that care plan so you know who to get in touch with um, to help guide you with that decision making. Um, but definitely, if your son is still unwell, so if you're giving that oral extra dose uh, in addition to your daily dose of steroids and you're at day two, day three, you should definitely be touching base with um, a physician on your care team. So either the endocrinologist or uh, your neuromuscular team or your family physician, depending on who is helping manage that care. Okay, so now we're continuing with Samir. So the next day, Samir is still not feeling well. So we had those body aches and the fever. And this morning, uh, 20 minutes after Samir took his regular steroid medication, he vomited. So our question is, what do you do now as parents? Do you wait until tomorrow to give the next regular steroid do dose? Or B, do you immediately repeat the steroid dose? Or C, you give them extra steroid doses by mouth in the afternoon or evening. Or D, do you give them an intramuscular dose of hydrocortisone? Okay, so I'm seeing um, some excellent answers. They're spread across all three of them. Um, so 4% said, wait until tomorrow morning to give his next regular dose. 14% um, um, said, immediately repeat the steroid. 25% uh, said, give him an extra steroid, uh, extra dose of, or half dose of steroid in the evening or afternoon. And 57% given an uh, intramuscular dose of hydrocortisone. I think when we were looking at what Dr. Ward had discussed, um, it's really if you can't keep your corticosteroid dose down, 
um, then it would be important to give an IM dose of the hydrocortisone. So that's that injection of hydrocortisone. Um, but I think we also have to be practical. If you, if, if you vomited one time and it just happened to be a one-off vomit, you can absolutely repeat that steroid dose because remember, at the end of the day, we want it's better to give that dose of steroid because that can be life saving than not give that dose of steroid. And depending on how Samir is doing throughout the day, um, you would either give the extra steroid if he is able to keep things down, but if he keeps on vomiting, you give that IM dose of hydrocortisone, and then you would uh, touch base with either your care team, um, either your neuromuscular team, endocrinologist, or go to your local emergency room. And I know in Toronto, our uh, protocol would be going to the emergency room. So you're going to find every clinic does things slightly differently. So it's really important to have that conversation with your neuromuscular team. Oh, look at that. I already answered my own question. Sorry about that. So after you give the intramuscular dose of hydrocortisone, what would you do? Would you A, monitor it him at home? B, call the endocrinologist or neuromuscular team? C, go to the nearest emergency room? Or D, B and C? Excellent. So we have... Um, really, we have uh, some people who call endocrinology and some uh, and 70 percent said either call endocrinology or the neuromuscular team or go to the nearest emergency room. And so really, it's it's important to remember that if there's vomiting, then you need to think about what your next step or your next action item is going to be. And so that'll either be directly speaking with someone who is knowledgeable about adrenal suppression and DMD or going to the local emergency room to ensure that he, your son is doing well. Now we're going to move on to another case. And so this is about John. So he is a 15 year old male with Duchenne. He uses a wheelchair for mobility. And during a transfer, he had a fall to, to the ground. He immediately experienced leg pain. His parent was able to transfer him onto the couch. He developed a headache about 15 minutes later and had some difficulties breathing. So what would you do next? So we have a couple of choices here. So A, would you wait to see if the symptoms resolve? B, would you call 911 or an ambulance? C, give an intramuscular hydrocortisone injection. D, give an oral steroid stress dose or some combination. So a and B, or sorry, B and C, so calling an ambulance and giving an injection, or calling an ambulance and giving an extra steroid dose. I'll give just a few more seconds for people to respond because there are lots of options in this. So the majority of people chose E, which is um, calling an ambulance and giving an intramuscular hydrocortisone dose. And so I would absolutely agree with that management because we know he's had a major, he's had a fall. We know his legs hurting and now he's starting to have some breathing issues as well as a headache. Um, I do see another individual said call 911 and absolutely that is also a, a very important response. So I do know that not everybody has intramuscular uh, injections at home. So if you call an ambulance and you let them know that they're on steroids and you're worried about fat embolism syndrome, uh, that is 100% appropriate. So Dr. Ward did an excellent job of talking about fat embolism syndrome. And what she discussed was that fat droplets are released from the bone marrow. And it's commonly after fractures, usually long bone fractures. So that could be your leg, which is a femur, or it could be after body trauma. And I really want to highlight what uh, Frank and Tori said. When we've seen fat embolism syndrome, a lot of times we actually don't see a fracture. And it's because there are these small little fractures and you need to see them on a CT scan or some other imaging that can really highlight that there's a fracture uh, that has happened. 
So as Dr. Ward said, we have these fat droplets that can go into the blood circulation, they can affect the lungs. And so that can be shown as shortness of breath, just some, maybe some difficulties breathing, breathing a little bit faster. And this is because there's less oxygen um, going, uh, uh, there's less oxygen um, uh, getting into your bloodstream because of what's happening in your lungs. And this can also affect your brain. So that's where Dr. Ward was talking about those little droplets of fat going into your brain. And sometimes you can have a headache. Sometimes you can have confusion. Sometimes you can become very, very sleepy. And so really, if you have any of these symptoms, so breathing or neurologic symptoms, you call 911. You want to ensure there's been some stress steroids given and you want to be seen immediately in the eMERGE. Now, this is a rare condition. And I know people have talked about how it can happen pretty quickly after a fall. And you're right, absolutely. Many times it can happen fairly quickly after a fall. But this is something that can also evolve and occur over up, like up to 72 hours. So I think it's just something that's really important for you as a family or as an individual with Duchenne being aware of this, that up to about the three day mark is when you need to be thinking about this. So say you've had a fracture, it's being dealt with, you're back home, but then you start developing symptoms, you need to immediately call 911 and go back to the eMERGE. So I really like Dr. Ward's infographic about this. So having a fall, any breathing issues or confusion, go to the emergency room because it is a medical emergency. So the key things, if, if it's suspected at all at home, are those three steps. So 911, intramuscular hydrocortisone, if you don't have that, highlight to the paramedics about being steroid dependent and the need for an IM injection of hydrocortisone. Uh, many paramedics are able to give that. And, and it also comes to educating the medical professionals in the emergency room about the risk of fat embolism syndrome, as well as the risk of adrenal insufficiency or steroid dependence. And I did see a question in the chat of how come individuals in the eMERGE aren't aware of this? And I think, um, I think this is where it's really important to be educated as uh, young men with Duchenne as well as parents with Duchenne and having some of those pocket, pocket cards or information on your iPhone because in an emergency, it is, um, it's hard to remember absolutely everything. And so if you have some sort of strategy or some information that you can quickly share with the healthcare professionals, it can be quite helpful. So the key thing of both Dr. Ward's and my presentation today is just remember that stress steroid dosing is really your lifeboat. And that's, it's so important to be aware of this um, from a medical standpoint. And we hope that individuals will not need uh, stress dosing. However, we, however, it's important to be educated in case this is needed. So I think I'm gonna hand this back uh, to Nicola. Oh, and Rick. Or to me, sure, that's fine. We're both here. Laura, thanks so much. That, that was terrific. And Dr. Ward, uh, a very informative presentation on this important topic. Um, you know, we've had feedback from, from people who've been watching different uh, communication modes and, and uh, everybody's really greatly appreciated uh, the information you were able to, to share tonight. I also want to send a special thanks to Frank and Tori for a very informative uh, and, I mean, difficult story to tell, but extremely well done and, and very, very important. Uh, as you suggested, I think Dr. McAdam and, and Dr. Ward, you know, this is not uh, common, but it, nevertheless, it can happen. And I think we need to be prepared. And that's terrific. Uh, right now, we're not going to uh, hold anything back here any longer. We're going to open the discussion uh, to questions. Um, I'd like to remind you to please be mindful when sharing personal information. This is being recorded at whatever level you are comfortable with. Uh, please proceed. We're going to deal with the with the chat questions first, and then we'll, we'll open it up 
for individuals who, who want to participate. So please use the raise hand feature to let us know if you'd like to turn on your camera and audio, or alternatively, you can post a question in the chat. Still do that if you like for our speakers, and uh, we will get to those as well. But the chat questions that came uh, early in the uh, conversations, uh, I know, uh, Dr. McAdam, you already dealt with one, uh, doctors in the hospital who just don't know about this. And, and uh, I don't know if there's anything more that needs, needs to be said there. In this particular instance, this was from Vincent, uh, uh, it, it was uh, someone with muscular dystrophy who takes a daily dose of corticosteroids and is in shock. The situation happened in 2013 after a leg fracture almost 10 years ago. And in Frank's most recent uh, example, there's still not that awareness. And another part of this was, should you always take a dose of steroids with you to the hospital? So I'll just throw that back out there for a little more uh, a response from, from uh, either Dr. McAdam or Dr. Ward. I can take a crack at it. Thank you for the question. I mean, I think that, you know, tonight is a big part of raising awareness and I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to speak on this along with the others on the panel. Certainly, I think there's a few things that we could be adding to what we've discussed already to help avoid um, showing up in the eMERGE and people not really knowing what to do. One is that the neuromuscular specialist or the endocrinologist can put a red flag on your file Many centers now have an electronic medical record and we have the opportunity to put little red flags or little um, notes about the things that are really important to alert anybody who's opening up the chart. So for example, allergies is one. I open up a chart and it'll say allergy to whatever. And that just tells me without having to ask the patient. So the same can be done with steroid dependence. And then I think having a medical alert bracelet is really important. People will see that when they examine you. The first thing they'll do is they'll look for that. They'll check your pulse if it's on your arm. They'll see it on your neck. And the moment a physician or any healthcare provider sees steroid dependence, that will trigger them to think about the adrenal suppression. And then those little cards where we even write down the dose to be given in an emergency. These are things that I think families can have in their toolbox to help you know, educate the healthcare providers that are around them. Once you mention to a physician steroid dependence, adrenal suppression, I think that most physicians will really clue into that. It's sometimes just thinking about it in the setting of an emergency where there's a lot going on and a lot of concern. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree with Dr. Ward. I guess the other thing just to add is that fat embolism syndrome is very, very uncommon in pediatrics as well as in young adults. So this is not going to be something that they think about when they initially see you because um, it's, it's something that it, you'd see mostly in individuals who are significantly older. And so it's not gonna be on the top of their diagnosis and they're going to be thinking about your neuromuscular condition because my guess when Frank took Tori to the eMERGE, they thought, oh, his breathing is just because he's got Duchenne muscular dystrophy and it's not that there's something else that's going on. Yeah, I would agree that FES is not something that's gonna be on the tip of the tongue. Adrenal suppression, I hope so. But FES, yeah, that's, uh, that's far more rare. So I really support that, uh, that comment, yeah. Um. Uh, we have another uh, question here. Uh, Frank or Tori, did you want to add anything to that discussion? No. Um, I, I think that's a great. I think that's a great point. Um, the funny thing for us, and, and maybe one of the doctors can can comment on this, is that when we gave the list of his medications, they just stared at the plaza court almost as if, "What mm -hmm. is this? We don't even know what it is, or we don't mm -hmm. have it." I'm just wondering, is is the Vlasicort uh, uncommon or hard to get? I, I think it might be harder to get, but they just seem like they didn't know what it was or maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I felt. So, so I can definitely start with this. And I think that oh, that was also a question that came up in the chat. So Deflazacort is something, is a medication that most physicians have never heard of before. 
So we definitely know about it within the Duchenne community, um, but other physicians will have never heard of it. And that's why it's so important um, to talk about steroid dependence. And so you're going to likely need to make that link that deflazacort is a steroid medication, and then they can go from there. And on some of the um, wallet cards that are exist out there, um, they also talk about how to convert deflazacort to prednisone because patients know about prednisone, but they won't know about deflazacort. And uh, Kelly, Tori's mom has chimed in and she said uh, that they did have to work really hard to get the doctors to give them extra steroid. Uh, so it wasn't something, it uh, doesn't sound like they were, you know, automatically just going to do. So it sounded like that was a bit, a bit challenging too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. may I just add, may I yeah. just add Rick, that yeah. I, I would agree, you know, I see all the children at CHIA who are on uh, steroids for three or more months for just general steroid side effect type of management. And deflazacort is used uniquely in the Duchenne setting. So it's not surprising that people aren't familiar with that. So we seem to need to do some education there. And then in, in terms of your question about whether to, to take your steroid to the emergency room, absolutely. Let's say you're waiting around in the waiting room and things just aren't moving along and you're aware that an extra dose needs to be given in the evening or the late afternoon, then you can do that, right? Or you maybe you have your healthcare provider on the phone while you're waiting in the eMERGE and the instruction can be given to take it. So I definitely would take your steroids with you when you go to the hospital. Um, and the deflazacort may not be readily available if you're admitted to the hospital and you need your dose the next day so you can use your personal supply Deflazacort is available by, by special access, as you know, so it takes right. some time to get into the hospital. Okay, and now we have other, other questions that we want to share too, and I, I want to call on uh, Clementine LeDuc if we could get uh, her onto the uh, chat here, uh, Kate, who's working on hard behind the scenes. Uh, if we could open the mic and, and, and have her sign in. There was a question regarding, I believe it was regarding, uh, there was a, a bit of a language issue, but the, the decreasing deflazacort, is that a mistake? And I, I will ask, there, there we go, let you ask the question. Yeah, good evening. So yeah, I'm from Montreal. I'm, I'm a nurse working at the neuromuscular clinic. And uh, I discussed with a mother yesterday who explained to me that her son uh, who is in a, um, a, a house, like a hospital, a CHSLD. It's like a, a, an hospital. Um, and he has a, the COVID. So he started the, the medication, Plaxovid, and they, they decided to decrease his deflazacor. So I was surprised and regarding what I just uh, hear tonight, I was wondering if it was a mistake or if it was normal. Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. We're thinking. <laughs> I, I personally, I, I'll be interested to hear what Dr. McAdam says, but I personally can't think of a reason why someone would want to decrease the steroids in someone who's steroid dependent. So I am sitting here thinking, why would they have wanted to decrease the steroids? And we normally wouldn't do that, right? Because there is that steroid dependence. If anything, you'd need to give extra doses if someone is unwell. So I can't give you an explanation for that off the top of my head. Dr. McAdam, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I was having a very similar thought process because I think at for the majority of my patients, if they're in hospital because they're very unwell, they're actually getting uh, IV stress dosing of steroids, so a much higher dose than our daily dosing, um, just to help their general body systems that cortisol is so important for. Um, I, uh, but I, there may be very special circumstances in this case that I'm not familiar with, um, so, so I'm not sure. 
I, I can offer um, a little further insight because I, I am aware there was um, um, a family that had a similar type of question that we tried to investigate for them to get some information. And I think that um, the, uh, the antiviral that they're using and the concern is that there may be some drug-drug interaction. Um, so I think that's why they're recommending that they decrease the um, deflazacord because of uh, potential drug-drug inter uh, interaction. Um, I, that's all I know in terms of why that might be a consideration because mm -hmm. they want to put them on the antiviral. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I, I think the key thing, as long as they're monitoring the cortisol and the overall, uh, uh, to ensure that they have enough steroid, but I can appreciate drug interactions. Would be challenging. Yeah. And uh, blood. Sorry, sorry Leanne. Just to say, blood pressure is a good indicator of whether a patient is in hospital doing okay on their medications, whether the steroids have been adjusted or not. So, if the blood pressure is falling, that's a classic sign of adrenal suppression and the need for more steroids. So, as Laura said, that if they're monitoring vital signs, heart rate, oxygen levels, blood pressure, and everything is okay, and the patient is tolerating a lower dose of steroid, then presumably then that's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, Nicola. Um, we want to move to uh, Duane and Karen Allen, who have a question for, uh, for the panel here this evening. Duane and Karen, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, it, this isn't so much a question. It's more of a uh, just to, to reconfirm what Dr. Ward um, has said through this presentation. So our son, James, is 12. He has Duchenne and is under Dr. Ward's care at CHEO. And I guess the biggest thing is communication is the key with your healthcare providers. And, you know, Dr. Ward highlighted it and Dr. McAdam as well. Um, so James had to go in for surgery earlier this month. And it was thanks to PJ's protocol, but also thanks to Dr. Ward uh, providing the guidance to the urology team uh, at CHEO for how we were going to help James through just a routine surgery, but how important that was that, you know, we had PJ's protocol originally, and then, you know, we highlighted that to the urologist, but then it was like, you know, Dr. Keys, I, the urologist, you need to talk to Dr. Ward because it's so important. And when the two of them were actually able to talk and touch antennas, you know, they came up with an, an action plan on how James was going to be cared for through that, through his surgery. And, you know, it came out, he came out with flying colors. Um, we're going to see Dr. Ward at the beginning of May, um, but we can't, stress, you know, communication is the biggest part in, in all of this. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, we have a couple more questions in the chat that we want to get to uh, from Yulia uh, to everyone. How FAS should be treated in hospitals is the question. So I think this is I think there are, there are many different ways that fat embolism syndrome needs to be treated in hospitals. I think, number one, it needs to be recognized. And so that means the emergency physicians or the physicians on the ward um, are likely going to need to be pointed in the right direction for this. And But I think even before the fat embolism syndrome, just ensuring that they're getting those stress dosing of steroids so that I am stress dosing of steroids, because by the time you're bringing your child to the eMERGE, um, their body's already under a lot of stress and you've recognized that at home. And so, and once they've had the I am dose of steroids and Dr. Ward, you can correct me, that kind of gives you six hours for them to uh, for the healthcare team to generate a plan for your son, and then they will need another dose. So it's not just a one-time dose, and then you don't need to think about it, but it gives you that six-hour window so the physicians can see how your son is doing. Would, would you agree with that, Dr. Ward? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Buys you time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and six hours is, is right. So I would agree with that. And I guess the other thing is it's 
similar to other diagnoses, fat embolism syndrome evolves over time. And so, um, so some of the things that both Frank and Tori discussed, how his breathing was faster, um, that's one sign of fat embolism syndrome, his heart rate was beating faster. That's actually within, uh, when you're looking at how fat embolism syndrome is described, that is very common. The hard thing is there's no medication we can use to treat fat embolism syndrome. So really what you're doing is you want to be in a place where the doctors are watching your child or your young adult um, very closely. So as things change, they can respond to them. And I know Tori, as well as Frank, talked about the need for intubation. So we know the lungs can be affected in fat embolism syndrome. So we want to ensure that those doctors are monitoring that. How is the breathing going? Do you, if does your body need that extra support? And if your body needs that extra support, then you should be intubated to help your body um, or help your lungs through that acute phase of fat embolism syndrome. And and so although I know there were some challenges along the way with, uh, with the, Tori's care um, and the advocacy that was needed, uh, he was intubated. So they recognized all those other, other signs that Tori's body was telling them that something serious was going on. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm sorry, if I can just add a little sorry, something. Yeah. Um, so from my experience, and I was obviously intubated, so I don't, I don't know this, but this is from what my dad told me, and he could probably provide better answers, but I knew our, the doctor that we had, and I think this was not, this is not to most doctors, I think just, but the specific doctor we had was convinced it was not fat embolism syndrome for a while, and it took a lot of fighting from my, both my parents and from my personal doctor, my specialist, to get anything done. So I feel like that's important that if your doctor is trying to convince you that it isn't, you should still keep in touch with your other doctor and make sure there's some information like that being passed to the doctor that's treating you because they could be very convinced it's something else when it is fat embolism syndrome. Great, thanks. And Tori, Tori, just one other thing. I, I agree with you and I've had that uh, in several circumstances, but I think it's that advocacy of um, your parents as well as your healthcare team that surrounds you that's really important. Um, the other thing, and this is more to parents, is when your child is confused, they're going to tell you they don't want to go to the emergency room. And so I think it's really as, as, a, as a parent, you know, taking a step back going, I really think we do need to go to the emergency room your leg is hurt or, or your body isn't feeling well, we need to get you checked out. And so it's very hard for anybody when they're confused to be making those, those decisions. So it's really trusting your, your thoughts as a parent of saying, you know what, we do have to go. Good point. Um, another question's come in. Uh, this is from Maria. If my child needs oxygen, what do I need to say to the ER medic or nurses? How do I get that looked after? Yeah, I mean, uh, one would hope that, you know, what your concern is will be listened to, right? So we certainly are trained just to listen to patients and understand their concerns and understand the basis for their concerns. I would hope that if you said, I think my child needs oxygen, that the healthcare provider would take a close look at the breathing and do a thorough physical exam and check for the oxygen saturation and provide oxygen if there is difficulties breathing and there are problems with the oxygen saturation levels. I think if you get in a situation where you feel that you're, you're not being heard for whatever reason, that that's when you should try to reach out to your subspecialist, to your neuromuscular specialist, who's really an expert in the condition and can help advocate just as happened with Tori and, and Frank's situation. So those would be my, my recommendations there. Yeah, and I guess just one thing to build on what Dr. Ward was talking about is when you have respiratory muscle weakness, you can receive oxygen, but you have to have your, uh, your carbon dioxide monitored. 
And so that's something that can be done in the in an ambulance, uh, depending on the level of ambulance. Uh, but it most certainly can be done in a hospital. So if you have any muscle weakness, you need to have that carbon dioxide um, monitored because with the way how our lungs work is we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out the waste, which is carbon dioxide. And when you have and when you have muscle weakness, if you're given oxygen, then your CO2 or your carbon dioxide can build up in your system and make you feel very sleepy. But people won't be able to tell because if they're only monitoring your oxygen saturation, because that can look normal, but you could be in trouble. And so the key thing is if you have breathing muscle weakness. Um, so, and I think Maria, I see that you talked about BiPAP. So if you're yes. on BiPAP, you've got breathing muscle weakness. So your CO2 has to be monitored. So you can give oxygen safely. You just have to have the proper monitoring for it. And I usually tell families just around your BiPAP that if you're on BiPAP and you're going to the emergency room and you think you're going to be there for a while because there are long wait times, bring your BiPAP with you. And if you have cough assist, bring your cough assist with you as well. It's better to have a few too many pieces of equipment um, than not having what you need when you're there. Great. Uh, any, uh, they, she just thanks you and says that's that's so clear. So uh, that's great. Uh, um, just want to see if there are any more questions from our participants this evening. Uh, we do not have. I don't see anything else in the chat. Uh, here comes one from uh, from Vincent. Another piece of education is regarding heart. A patient with Duchenne may have troponin release from their heart during an emergency. Comments. Yeah, it's so, uh, just as a step back, so in general, when we think of troponins as a healthcare professional, we think of a heart attack. Um, but in Duchenne, uh, Vincent, you are 100% accurate. We have some patients with Duchenne, they almost always have an elevated troponin and nothing is going on with their heart. They're not having an, an acute heart issue. Um, and part of that has to do with some of the changes we see with Duchenne in the heart. Now, the other thing that you're bringing up, Vincent, is when you are critically unwell, or if you are even slightly unwell, you may transiently or for a short period of time have an elevated troponin that's coming from your heart. And it's not saying you're having an acute heart issue. It's just saying my body is really stressed and my heart is working extra hard. And so I think that is a really important thing to bring up. Um, so doctors may see that um, and may be going down a different route, but a lot of times troponin, especially in uh, adolescents, I've seen it in young children as well as in young adults, their troponins are elevated, just saying their body and their heart is under a lot of stress. Um, and I think this is where it's important to also have a good relationship with your cardiologist, because if your troponin's elevated in Duchenne and you are not having an acute heart issue, uh, heart issue, the ECG is the same. And so that's so those acute care professionals uh, can get in touch with your cardiologist if they aren't at that same hospital to compare those ECGs. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Any other uh, uh, questions you want to put in the chat or anyone want to raise their hand for last call for questions? Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, I, I do want to uh, remind everybody and hope you'll be able to use the link in our chat to complete this short evaluation it's only through your feedback that we're able to develop these meaningful educational programs. So we really would appreciate if you could, could complete that for us, that would be terrific. And the link uh, Nicola will be, be, will be providing. I just wanna ex also extend a huge thank you to everyone who took time out of their busy schedules to be with us today, um, especially to our speakers and guests for sharing their knowledge and experience with us and to Frank and Tori, uh, Dr. Ward, Dr. McAdam, thank you so very, very much. Uh, we hope you will get involved with Defeat Duchenne Canada, whether it's helping to raise funds through your local community, sharing your story to raise awareness, becoming an advocacy ambassador, donating, volunteering, 
or simply joining the conversations that we have on social media. Again, don't forget to subscribe to our e-news to hear the latest on research, advocacy, and education at defeatduchenne.ca. Thank you to one and all. And uh, we, we have Nicola to just uh, say a few words before we wrap the evening up. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, everyone. This was an incredible dissemination of information um, and uh, a really great discussion. I really want to thank Dr. McAdam and Dr. Ward for your time um, and uh, and sharing your expertise with us, and also Frank and Tori. I really want to thank you guys for for sharing your story. This is so important, and you know this information is critical for our families to understand and to know. It could save lives, um, uh, or if anything, it will certainly make our experience if we're ever in in that situation uh, a little less stressful hopefully and um, just I just wanted to say a couple of things because I, I made a couple of notes just some key highlights in terms of you know what families need like the, the key takeaways from today and I think Frank you hit it on the nose the big one is communication right communication is key um, it's around planning ahead of time and making sure you discuss and create a plan with your physician so whoever your key physician is who's treating you for your steroids it could be a neuromuscular physician maybe it's your family doctor but whomever that individual is, uh, sit down with them, plan out what you should do in emergency care situations if you haven't done that. Not just a memory. Um, and, also it's, and also it's really important to know who to contact, who's your point of contact. So if you find yourself in a situation, make sure you know who is that person that you can contact and reach out to, um, to let them know what's happening and who can support you and also help advocate for you if you're in that situation you need to advocate. And I just want to say one last thing too is never stop taking your steroids. I think that's super, super important. We just certainly don't want to forget that. Um, and if you ever do need to go to Emerge, make sure you bring those steroids with you, whatever it is that you're taking and any other equipment that you might be using, whether it's BiPAP or cough assist. I think those are all really, really important messages that uh, I've heard today, sir. And I've learned a lot. Um, we do have, we will have resources up on our website um, on defeatdeshen.ca. If you go under living with Deshen, uh, Deshen management and phases of Deshen, you'll find a lot of the resources that we've spoken about today, including PJ um, Nikoloff's uh, steroid protocol. Uh, I recommend sharing that with all of your healthcare providers who aren't familiar with Deshen or, um, you know, who, who don't know you uh, as well. It's a really important uh, document to share. Um, I also also wanted to um, direct you and, and I just want to let you know that uh, Defeat to Shen Canada is um, working on resources for patients for our families in Canada so that is something that we are committed to doing this webinar is just the first part of um, you know what's to come in terms of developing additional resources uh, whether it be emergency cards that you can take into clinic with you uh, or something on your phone that's easy to access so you have that information on hand uh, in the meantime time there's a lot of great resources on online uh, we want to direct you to ppmd's emergency cards and, and hopefully kate can throw those in the chats uh, the links to those they're really really great uh, if you don't already have something like that um, certainly i uh, want to look at that um, and also wanted to say that this webinar it will be emailed to you by uh, early next week and it'll also be on our website um, as well and then I just want to end it. Last thing I promise, and I appreciate everyone staying on the line, um, is we're actually thinking um, we're going to launch a emergency care slogan contest. And as we're developing these resources for families, we would like to reach out to our families to help us develop a memorable slogan, uh, some kind of a catchy phrase uh, that will help us to remember when to take extra steroids. And um, this is something that, that we're gonna be developing, but we're looking for you to you to help us come up with some catchy slogan. And uh, an example is extra steroids save lives. I think this one was a suggestion from Dr. Ward and uh, we'll be sure to submit that one on your behalf, Dr. Ward. Um, but uh, if you can help us come up with a, a few ideas, uh, the lucky winner will have that slogan recognized on all of our Defeat, uh, Defeat Deshen Canada emergency care, care material. Uh, so just if you submit your creative suggestions to info at defeatdeshen.ca, um, hopefully that's up in our chat box there too, uh, easy to get to, and um, by the end of uh, the month. So you have a month to, to help us come up with a catchy slogan. So looking forward to seeing what everyone comes up with. <laughs> so thank you so 
much again. Really appreciate your time. Uh, I hope that you've all enjoyed this uh, really great webinar. Um, and um, have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>